As 2023 approaches, the race for who will occupy different elective positions is getting heated. However covert it may be, the gladiators across political parties have begun to put machinery in place. Over the past few months, politicians have been granting interviews, making strategic statements to whip up sentiments or position themselves to run for office. The latest of which came from Nigeria's former Vice President, Atiku Abubakar, who said Nigerians are eager for the People's Democratic Party to take over power in 2023, while discussing issues concerning the party's unity and stability during a visit to the River State Governor. With PDP seems, the PDP seems to be losing its grip at the center, weakening the only strong opposition party in Nigeria. In Abuja studio to speak on the importance of a strong opposition party and its views on what informs electorate's decision during elections is a political analyst, Sunday Adejo. You're welcome to the studios, Dr. Adejo. Good to have you. Good morning. Thank you for, thank you for having me. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good to have you, sir. Well, let's, let's get right into it. Uh, the visit of the former Vice President, Atikwa Bubaka, uh, to the River State Governor, uh, Yesom Wiki, uh, of course, was loaded with a lot of political, uh, if you like, expletives. Uh, and this seems, without a doubt, is, you know, is about the 2023 elections. And he did say uh, that his, the Nigerians were ready uh, to have PDP back in 2023. Uh, we know for a fact, of course, that um, uh, given what went down uh, in 2019, uh, things didn't seem uh, to be chumming between uh, former Vice President Abubakar uh, and the River State Governor. But it looks like things are looking up now. Uh, so I'd like to have your thoughts. I is this about uh, PDP trying to build a virile opposition, or is this another round of articles coming? What are your views? Well, I want to say that, you know, as far as politics is concerned, there is no permanent friend, there's no permanent enemy, but permanent interest. So regardless of what must have transpired between uh, the former vice president and the governor of River State, I think at this point, uh, their interest is what is playing out. Uh, but having said that, uh, you agree with me that uh, the move of the former vice president was a strategic one, of course, to promote not just his own political interest, but also the interest, you know, of the People's Democratic Party. Uh, what he has said is not uh, unexpected, you know, from a politician, of course, who had been, you know, the presidential aspirant of People's Democratic Party. Yes, it seems like uh, in the next, thought, in the forthcoming elections, the Nigerians are going to vote out the APC and, of course, bring in PDP on board. Uh, that is what it looks like, but uh, politics is full of surprises. It's not a guarantee that, you know, in 2023, that, of course, uh, PDP is going to capture power from the APC. But I won't say that there is a need to, you know, there's a need to have a comparative analysis uh, between what was and what is. Where were we, you know, uh, in before, before the advent of APC, and where are we now, six years down the line, you know, of APC handling, you know, political power in Nigeria? Yes, as a political analyst and not a politician, of course, I would not want to say that the statement of the former vice president is a statement of fact. It will look like I am a politician. But like I said, if we do a comparative analysis, you understand that regardless of the odds of the present administration, there are areas where the administration or the APC have made giant strides, and we cannot, we cannot, you know, we cannot jettison that. In terms of infrastructure, look at the rail system, look at the transport system, then of course, in terms of diaspora issue, we have seen beautiful efforts, you know, as managed by Honorable Abike Dabri. For the first time, diaspora are given, you know, the necessary attention that, of course, that they should be given to. But having said that, if you look at where we are in comparison to where we were, you will look at the key developmental index of Nigeria is dwindling. In fact, Nigeria is getting worse off compared to what we had, you know, under the PDP administration. Yes, there are giant strides in terms of infrastructure. Yes, we have functional rail system, and of course they are promising to do more. Yes, we have a lot as far as diaspora matters are concerned. But what happens to, you know, to, to human development? What happens 
happened to human capacity development? What happened to poverty? What has happened to unemployment? What has happened to insecurity in our country? I think these are fundamental issues, you know, that the electorate will need to take into consideration come 2023. Nigeria has become the poverty capital of the world. Nigeria has become most unsecured or most insecure as it were compared to what, you know, what we had. As I speak to you, uh, most schools in the northwestern part of Nigeria are shut down because of the activities of bandits. As I speak to you, a lot of children are in the hands of these captives. A lot of Nigerians are under captivity because the APC has not been able to guarantee the security that they promised Nigerians. As I speak to you, what is the exchange rate between the Nigerian Naira and the dollar? What is the price of commodities in the market? What is the value of the Nigerian dollar? What is the rate of inequality? What is the rate of unemployment? We can go on and on and on. And so regardless of the fact that we have serious improvement in, in economic growth, in terms of development, in terms of human capacity, in terms of human well-being and condition of living. I think the APC has not done well, and these are factors that the electorate will need to lay to bear before deciding who to vote for in 2023. Understood. Thank you very much for your question, for your answer there. In the early part of your answer, you did talk about the fact that while there may be temporary candidates, ultimately there are always going to be permanent interests. And as you've rightfully said, the economy, the state of equality between people, insecurity, education, those are all going to be things that play in the minds of the electorate when they go and cast their ballot. But another thing, another thing that has constituted a permanent interest is ethnicity. For a long time, there has been calls for Nigeria's next president to be from the south of the country. Do you think now, with Atuku obviously being from the northern part, our current administration being headed from somebody also from the north, do you think that the PDP will listen to that calling from the electorate to call for a southern candidate? Do you think that that's how they'll be able to change this landscape? Well, I, I don't see the PDP, you know, pushing forward a southern candidate for, for, for presidency. Uh, yes, no, there's no doubt that uh, ethnicity has become an integral aspect of our democracy and polity, which of course is one of the reasons why we are where we are today. When we begin to, when we begin to take decisions based on primordial sentiments, based on prejudice, based on stereotypes, based on nepotistic you know, uh, indices, we can't achieve success as a country. But having said that, Nigeria is a pluralistic society, and so it is not possible to holistically, you know, aggregate and articulate the interests of every tribe in Nigeria. And so part of the political calculus is that, you know, parties begin to bring up issues like, like rotational presidency and all of that. But you recall that even before President Jonathan contested, you know, in 2015, that position was supposed to have gone, you know, to the northern part of Nigeria based on, you know, the zoning formula designed by the People's Democratic party. And so it was against that order President Jonathan, you know, defied that principle and decided to contest. And of course, he lost. It is an obvious fact that come 2023, that the presidential aspirant of the People's Democratic Party is going to be from the north. And of course, that will tell you why President Atiku is still strategizing and of course ensuring that his political interest is protected. But I see that the APC is most likely going to present a candidate, you know, from the southern parts of Nigeria. All right, Dr. Devo, uh, that's a good one there. We'll, we'll go on a short break and, and when we return, we'll continue the conversation. Uh, please do stay with us. Welcome back to Arise News. We're still in conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Sonde Adejo, a political analyst who is speaking with us as regards what it takes to have a viral opposition uh, towards the 2023 election. So Dr. Adejo, good to see have you with us. Dr. Adejo, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I like your permutation regarding uh, the uh, suspicion that PDP will most likely field a northern candidate and uh, the thinking that APC might field 
uh, a southern candidate. I, I, I hope that I will have time to return to that. But before then, uh, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, bring you back to the question of uh, 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 what actually uh, breeds a virile opposition. And I know that being a political analyst and a lecturer, uh, you're very versed uh, in these matters that, you know, the symbols, the, the faces uh, of the opposition party are important. And in this case, as far as PDP is concerned, uh, both Vice President Atiku, uh, Abubakar, and uh, the River State Governor are key. But then if you look at their trajectory, uh, maybe there are issues that, you know, in discussing this, you might, you know, you might help us understand better if that will resonate uh, fine with the electorate. One, uh, 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 vice, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar uh, has not been, uh, uh, his fidelity to the ideals of the party that he is now with, you know, might be considered questionable. Yes, he was Vice President uh, for two terms with the PDP, but then he ran as a presidential candidate in 2007 under the ACN and then was an APC to install the same a government that is now criticizing, that he says he can do better. And then, of course, in, in 2019, he ran uh, as a PDP candidate. Governor Wiki, on the other hand, you know of what he said about him, that uh, he practically single-handedly installed uh, Secundos as the PDP chairman. And we know the undercurrents that are on now, as to if uh, the chairman of PDP will get uh, a, a, a second term as chairman. Uh, given the fact that at least two governors from PDP have now left, are in APC, uh, one somewhere in Eboi, uh, is also, you know, uh, uh, waiting in the wings to, to, to leave. Uh, do you think that the PDP is actually um, in a position to speak authoritatively about Nigerians wanting them back in 2023, or is this about an article, uh, a possibility of an article and a wiki a candidacy. Well, that's, that's, that's a very fundamental question. Uh, but like I said a while ago, you know, politicians are politicians, and politicians will continue to remain politicians. And so the core priority of a politician and of a political party is, of course, to capture power. And so they put in place different strategies, different modus operandi, you know, to ensure that they get to their final destination, which is, you know, to capture power. Yes, within every political party, there are internal controls contradictions and that's why you have room for conflict of interest and that gives room to one form of clash you know the other but at some point Politics is also about conflict, and politics is about the reconciliation of conflicting interests. And so when there's need for conflict, you get conflict, because of course, conflict is inevitable. And so when there's a need to set aside grievances to achieve, you know, a goal, you see politicians, you know, reconciling against all odds to ensure, you know, that their goal is, is, is achieved. Uh, but having said that, one political attitude of Nigerian politician is the fact that that, you know, they are, they are permitting to use that word, political prostitutes. People begin to prostitute from one political party to the other, especially when they have noticed that their membership of a political party, you know, will not favor their interests. And you see them decamping. Like you have rightly observed, the, the, you know, the governor of Ebo in state is now with the APC, the, the weeping governor, the governor of Rivers, uh, River State, no, that's Cross River that's State. Cross River. He's yeah. now also in, 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 in APC. You know, Zamfara. these are, these Zamfara are, in Nigerians, you, you begin to, Zamfara, of course, is the latest that has also joined, and you, you, you begin to wonder. You know that our political class cannot be held by what they say. I remember the governor of Zamfara State got this, you know, got, you know, became governor on the platform of the PDP, and of course, even vowed that nothing would separate him, you know, from the PDP. It's like somebody who has taken a marital vow on the altar before the congregation, and all of a sudden, the person is changing his intention. But as a political scientist, I am not surprised, and I'm sure Nigerians will not also be surprised because that has become, you know, part and parcel of our political culture, you know. But having said that, the PDP, regardless of what characterizes, you know, the administration of the PDP, 
what will eventually constitute a viral and vibrant opposition party is, of course, the party, you know, standing, serving as a watchdog, criticizing the activities of the ruling party where they are not getting it right. But of course, I know, you know, political parties always come, they don't say anything good about the ruling party. An ideal political party should appreciate where the, the ruling party is making effort. And areas where they are not making effort, areas where they are not achieving, they should criticize them. Over the years, I have not really seen PDP constituting itself as a viral opposition party. The challenge with most political parties in Nigeria is that they go to sleep as soon as election is over. And when elections are drawing nearer, they begin to reactivate. That is not what an ideal political party is meant to be. But having said that, over time, I've seen Governor Yes Nweke, you know, criticizing the activities of the APC. It seems to me like he's the only governor who is interested in challenging the ills within the society, who is interested in challenging the issues of bad governance, the issues of insecurity, and of course, the inability of the current, you know, administration to give Nigerians the dividends of democracy. That is not what an ideal political party. An ideal political party should not be an individual. It should be a collection of individuals who are interested in achieving you know political power and are interested in serving as a watchdog to the ruling political party mm, thank you very much for that dr Adejo. it's it's so interesting that you mentioned that because on its face the two most popular political parties in this country the ruling all progressive congress and of course the main opposition party the people's democratic party their politics doesn't seem to be starkly different they do seem, and as you rightfully say, to, to cross boundaries all of the time. And then again, because the politics of these parties isn't so different, I do imagine that the electorate will tend to gravitate towards a a candidate that they believe in and secondly there is also the situation where during any type of political cycle an electorate would blame the current administration for any type of struggles that they would have gone through so whether it's the economy uh, police brutality all of these different issues i wonder how you think the electorate would be able to or rather that the political parties themselves will be able to shape themselves using policy rather than just people, because then we get to a, a better understanding, a better grasp of politics. Or do you disagree? Do you think that the politics between these two parties are, are inherently dissimilar? Or do you think that they are too similar? And that is why it's so easy for politicians to jump from one party to the other to the detriment of the electorate. Well, that's a, that's a dicey one. Some persons believe that there's no difference between PDP and APC. Uh, we have given PDP an opportunity for several years. Of course, they didn't, they didn't take us to the promised land. And so to get a political party that will take us to the promised land and a messiah, we all voted massively for President Muhammadu Buhari. But sincerely, what we are getting today as Nigerians is not what we voted for. It's not what we expect. And so the implication of this is that Nigerians are losing trust in the political class. Regardless of the platform that you come under, it could be any political party outside APC or PDP. The fundamental thing is that Nigerians are seeing all politicians as birds of the same feathers. And so trust is a serious issue that has seriously eroded as far as the political class is concerned. Just take a look at what transpired recently in the National Assembly with regards to electronic transfer you know, of results. That, that, that was one of the greatest disappointments that Nigerians got from those that they stood under the sun and in the rain to vote for. I'm telling you, thrust is gradually becoming an issue. And if we are not careful, that will lead to a lot of political apathy because Nigerians are getting disinterested as far as politics is concerned. But having said that, there will be a need to prove Nigerians wrong, and Nigerians need to realize that we have come of age, and we must take our political destiny into our hands. A situation where we gradually forget all we have suffered because a politician approaches people, they give them so they give them onions, they give them my uh, give them 10,000, 5,000, and we forget the trajectories and the plight that we have passed through thus far. It is, it is a serious situation. I saw a recent video going viral where politicians, I think that was in Ghana or where, shared bags of rice to electorate and they rejected those things. In, in that Ghana. is 
it, you know, a political, Ghana. you know, that's the electorate. Ghana, that's correct. That's the electorate coming of age. And Nigerians must learn lessons from what we have passed through over the years and ensure that whoever is voted for, regardless, you know, the platform the person is coming under, we vote for a candidate that can take us to the promised land. We vote not bringing sentiments and primordialism, you know, into consideration until we begin to do that. We will just be dancing within the same cycle and putting round peg in square holes. All right, Dr. Adejo, I would like you to quickly weigh in on what is happening uh, in the southeast uh, regarding the IPOBs uh, a threat of another lockdown uh, this time around uh, every Monday from uh, a next week Monday if Namdekanu is not released. Uh, and I'm asking this not just because um, I doubt the capacity of, of IPOB to uh, effect this threat, uh, but then I, I wonder how much of politics, you know, can this draw along as we approach 2023, given that, you know, Southeast used to be the bastion of PDP, but now there's only three states that are with PDP in the Southeast. Uh, Imo State is now with the APC, and Ambra has always been with, with APGA. Um, what happens to the economy and to the political landscape of the Southeast if every Monday, if Inamdekanu is not released, and then every Monday from Upper Week, uh, there is a total lockdown of activities in the southeastern part of Nigeria. What are your thoughts? Well, I think the situation in the southeast is a very dangerous one. It doesn't depict something, it doesn't depict progress, it doesn't depict peace as far as our country is concerned, and of course, even the political economy of the southeastern part of Nigeria is a serious matter that needs uh, urgent attention, that needs to be handled with care because it's a very delicate issue and the government must up its game as far as managing the situation in the southeast is concerned. We have seen you know, an increasing rate of insecurity in the southeast that the southeast was never known for. You know, if you do a conflict mapping of Nigeria and the southeast and a threat analysis of what is going on in the eastern parts of Nigeria, you will see that it portends a lot of danger, not just to Nigeria, but of course, even the Southeast in particular. And of course, if you look at the recent declaration of a sit home, you know, or what they call Ghost Monday for every Monday from 9th of August, that portends a very dangerous trend, both for the lives and properties of people in the southeastern part of Nigeria and the state. And the stakeholders within the South is need to rise up to the occasion and ensure that this matter is nip in the board. You know, it is one thing to protest. It is another thing to protest within the ambit of the law. It is one thing to promote and project your fundamental human rights. It is another thing to ensure that in promoting your fundamental human rights, you do not trample on the rights of others. No individual, no organization, no society within a state has the legal you know, jurisdiction to declare such. You know. But we have seen even before now, sometimes in, in May this year, the, then the, the Unandikano himself, of course, asked Southeasterners to sit at home. And the governor, especially in Ebo, in Imo and some of these states, came out to say nobody has such right that people should go about their legal duties. But I tell you, on that day, there was a seat at home. Why? Because the Easterners are not even sure, they are not even guaranteed that the security agencies and the state government will be able to protect them in the event that there's an attack. And so to forestall or prevent or save their heads, they would rather yield to the others, you know, by, by iPod and stay at home than to follow what the government is saying because they are very sure that the government does not have the capacity, you know, to protect them. But having said that, what is going on in the southeast? And the modus operandi of IPOB does not depict something positive. Now, and even in the future to come, the modus operandi and the techniques and strategies used by iPod, if I were to be an externer, and of course a Nigerian that has concern for our country, for the life and properties of fellow citizens of Nigeria, it tells you that in the event that IPOB succeeds in establishing the state of Biafra, such a state would not necessarily be a democratic state. A state where people are coerced, where people are forced to sit at home, and where people are even warned that if they fail to sit at home, the consequences will be there. 
What will now happen if the state of Biafra eventually because succeeds? I think it is one thing to approach, to have a good strategy, to have a good intention. It's another thing to have the right strategy to achieve you know, this good intention. A lot of this needs you know, to be taken into consideration. No doubt, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. But the way and manner you approach these issues, the techniques and strategies, when they become antithetical to modern civil principles of governance, then it portends a lot of danger. And I feel that the state government, the stakeholders, the traditional rulers in Southeast need to come together and be very strong on this matter. Because in the end, and in the final analysis, everybody will bear you know, the brunt. Understood. Dr. Sunday, before we let you go, still on this topic of tempering the climate for a Southern candidate, don't you believe now that the current mood for a Southern candidate for the presidency would be one that would further peace and unity in this country? Democracy is a game of number. Based on number, it is almost going to be impossible for Southeasterners to produce the president of Nigeria because it's all about number. So your answer is no? <laughs> is that no, your but, but, I, but I'd like to take you further on that. Um, I, I, I'm interested in the mood of the nation, you know, and I'm interested in the sort of, uh, you know, gentleman's agreement, you know, uh, uh, within not just the APC, but in terms of how power is shared. If you say it's a game of number, and then we start calculating uh, that, you know, uh, 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 the northern part of the country has spent uh, a social number of years as against this, uh, does that not uh, suggest that a, a part of the country wants to lord it over, you know, the other part, if it's just strictly about the game of numbers? So I ask you again, for the mood of the country, isn't it better for, you know, uh, you know for equity to have a southern, and I'm not necessarily saying south is, south is part of the south, you know, but if, if the understanding is that the southern part of the country will produce the next president after eight years of Muhammadu Buhari, who is a northerner. Don't you think that that is uh, 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 what will calm the nerves in the country at this point? Well, you know, sometimes you have, there's what we call false sense of fulfillment. It seems as though if we have a president from my uh, extraction, I'm from Kogi State and I'm Igala. If I have a president from Kogi State who is Igala, then all is well with me. And that's the wrong notion that we have in Nigeria, that if the president is from the north, then all is well with the north. If the president is from the east, then all is well with the east. It doesn't work that way. There's a need for us to change our orientation. As a Nigerian, I do not, I do not, I'm not interested in where my president comes from. I'm interested in somebody who will create an enabling political and economic environment for me to thrive and for people who do business for their businesses to thrive. Over the years, look at Nigeria from 1960 to date. The northern part of Nigeria has produced the president of this country the most. Then, the southwestern part of Nigeria. But if you look at developmental indices in northern part of Nigeria, my dear brother and sister, it is nothing to write home about. The southeast, the in terms of developmental indices, in terms of human capacity, in terms of human development, the southeast is way, way better than the northern part of Nigeria put together. Yet, they have never produced the president. I think we must be, what we should begin to look at, for instance, is the fact that we should begin to have a policy where state governments and state governors can be held accountable. If every state governor in Nigeria, if all the local government chairmen of the 774 local government areas in Nigeria are up and doing, Nobody will be interested in who becomes the president of Nigeria. And of course, if Nigeria decides to practice federalism in the real essence of federalism, if Nigeria begins to ensure that regions control their resources and give to the center what is due to the center, nobody will be interested in the presidency. But unfortunately for us, we are just interested in the presidency, but the presidency, regardless of where he comes from, does not translate to anything tangible. The northern part of Nigeria, as I speak to you, is one of the most insecure parts of Nigeria. It has the highest rate of illiteracy. It has the highest rate of kidnapping and banditry. Yet all the presidents, almost all the presidents are from there. So what justification does he give at the end of the day? 
resource control through federalism and holding state government and local government chairmen accountable will give us the necessary political ecology that we need for every businessman, for every Nigerian to thrive, regardless of where the president is from. Understood, but I'd imagine that all you can do is deal with the, the deck of cards that you have. Yeah. And so if we're looking at the deck of cards we have, there are a certain amount of candidates. Of course, we can't look into the future and say for sure who these are who the candidates will be. But if we were to do a candidate by candidate analysis of the pros and cons, I want to put to you a few names. So, of course, we've got Atiku Abubakar. We've got uh, Bala Ahmed Tinubu. We've also got Isam Wike. And, of course, the current uh, Vice President Yemi Osibajo, if you were to look at those four candidates, in your own political scientist opinion, give us a brief run through of the pros and the cons of those candidates and how you think they would work for a better Nigeria, if at all. Uh, late Professor Ino Ukeiji once <laughs> said that for Africa to move forward, that the continent must be understood backward. If I want to give you my judgment on each of these candidates, all I'll need to do is to look at the antecedents. What have they done when they had opportunity? And what would they do if this opportunity is given to them? Of all these persons you have mentioned, my choice is the governor of River State. Based on what I have seen, I'm not from River State, I've never met him anywhere, but of course I've seen that for the first time in Nigeria, we have had a governor who is passionate, who is interested within the limit of his resources, you know, to transform the lives of people that he's governing. I will go for Yen Sunwiki if you ask me. But like I said, politics in Nigeria is complicated. The last election that took place, my candidate was Professor Mugalu, but I was sure from the onset that that guy was going nowhere, looking at the political equation of Nigeria. But of course, sometimes we keep the best and we take those that are not the best. And like somebody would say, if the wise would decide to allow fools to rule them, then the wise should be ready to bear the pain of foolish leadership. And that's what we are passing through in Nigeria. We have brilliant hands, first class materials, but when it comes to politics, they are not the choice of Nigerians. Because, of course, the politics starts from the political party when you are not even, when you don't get to be the flag bearer of your political party. It's wherever the political party presents to Nigerians as their flag bearer, the Nigerians will eventually, you know, be left with the option of voting for or not to vote for. Yes, President Yemi Osibanjo, a beautiful, you know, elegant young man, a professor of law, very brilliant. But one cannot judge to see Banjo now because he has been vice president. A vice president, if you ask me, in court, is just like a spare tire. Spare tire is used when your tire gets deflated. And so he has not gotten the opportunity to prove to Nigerians what he's able to do. Yes, you recall some years ago when the president was on medical leave or something, we saw a lot of vibrant you know, initiative. We saw vibrant decisions made by the vice president. We gave Nigerians some kind of hope that if this man were to be president, of course, I think that's the title of one article, if I were to be president. If this man were to be president, Nigeria would have been better off. Apart from these people, sincerely, the rest have been tested. I don't think they are the best that Nigerians can offer. But I think if Yesu Weke will come up, I will, he will be my candidate. But even if he's my candidate, he cannot win the presidency as far as Nigeria is concerned, looking at the political equation of Nigeria. Wow, wow, that, that's, a, that's a good one from you, but it, it does look like you are, uh, you are reflecting the mood of the nation, you know, in the choices, you know, and the analysis that you have made. But like you rightly said, you know, we'll wait and see what happens. You know, you've mentioned Governor Wiki, uh, you've, you know, uh, analyzed uh, Vice President uh, Yemio Shibajo. Uh, of course, you cleverly left out uh, Atiku and Tinobu, who have been, you know, tried and tested, but then you prefer, you know, fresh bloods. Let's see what happens. We'd like to thank you so much, Doctor, you know, for sharing your perspectives with us. You know, thank you indeed for joining us. Thank you.